Welcome to San Antonio's Influence Magazine show, the premier talk show where we introduce you to influential individuals doing significant work in the city of San Antonio and surrounding areas. Celebrate the spirit of business, leadership, and innovation. If this is your first time joining us and you'd like more information, you could find us at InfluenceSA.com. That's I-N-F-L-U-E-N-C-E-S-A.com. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Pinterest. And for this particular episode of the show, all future and past episodes of the show, pull up your YouTube search bar, toss in San Antonio's Influence Magazine show. That word is critical. Get that word in there. When you get there, please subscribe, give us a like or a thumbs up, and hit that bell so that you don't miss any future episodes of the show. I'm your host, Cedric Fisher, 40-year career journalist and publisher of Influence Magazine brand. When we come back, we're going to introduce you to today's guest. Don't go anywhere. Dream Leadership Academy is supporting the San Antonio community through their Hometown Heroes program. Together with their sponsor, Dental Quest, they are providing free care kits, dental supplies, and backpacks while engaging with local families. Connect with Dream Leadership Academy and stay tuned for their next opportunity to inspire and empower our people. All right, today's guest is San Antonio's own Mr. Willie Mitchell. Willie is a former professional football player. In fact, he was a member of the very first Super Bowl with the Kansas City Chiefs and Green Bay Packers. He's also a philanthropist, a father, a husband, and runs an organization called San Antonio Fighting Back, a nonprofit organization designed to assist individuals with improving their lives and really helping individuals that have been in, in some adverse situations. And help me welcome our featured guest for the day, the legendary football star, Mr. Willie Mitchell. Welcome to the show, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you. For, for, you're very welcome. First question is, I'm, I'm kind of an old school guy, so I use formal terms and call you Mr. Mitchell. What would you like me to call you? Just Willie. Willie? Be fine. Yeah, oh, okay. Be fine. My mom would appreciate that, yeah. that I <laughs> asked you about that. Um, so we, we introduce your background to the audience here, but just share a little bit about yourself, where you're from, um, maybe a little bit about your family, and that sort of thing. Okay. I'm from San Antonio, and I was born and raised in San Antonio. Uh, I have had five other brothers, and I was the fifth one of the six. Uh, I went to school here in San Antonio. I went to CUNY School, Douglas Junior High, and Wheatley High School. And I left here and went to college at Tennessee and I State University in Nashville, Tennessee. That's where I left there and went to the NFL as a Kansas City Chief. And uh, after that, that's where all the lifestyle changed, becoming a professional athlete and uh, coming back here to let the, the community know how much you appreciated their support. And that was the real issue that made the difference with me was coming back to my community and letting them know I appreciated, appreciated the support that they had given me as a young kid and even as a, after I went to college and then going into Kansas City. It made a very big difference in my life. We've talked offline about your background a little bit, your family, and a little bit about the San Antonio, a lot of the changes that have happened here. But, but tell us a little bit about your upbringing. What was it like? What were your parents like? What was the well, environment my like? Had a, uh, six boys and I was the fifth of the six. And she counseled us in the perspective that we had to represent ourselves in a positive way and we, we had to represent her in a positive way. And we couldn't go out and do any negative behavior because she told us what she expected of us. My dad said that he followed her in trying to do that, but her thing was to get an education and do the best that you could to help yourself and how important it was for you to get the education. And since a lot of it was free, 
then that's what she wanted to see us do was get an education and she wanted all of us to want to be educated for kids. So as one of the younger brothers, did you always feel um, a pressure to kind of measure up to the standard of your older brothers? Or? No, the thing about my oldest brothers, they gave me the consultation of what I needed to do as an athlete and being exposed to the community. They wanted me to carry myself in a positive way, and they told me that. And that's the way they leaded me along with my mother, is that I was a little active in playing baseball and football and basketball, and I was represent, uh, represented, represented uh, from that sport, but they wanted me to represent myself also and stay in a positive way. They and they, athletes as well. Yeah, and they did that for me. And whenever I needed something, they were always there to support me. And they told people, that's my little brother, Willie Mitchell. Okay. Yeah. So they covered your back too. Yeah, they covered my back. And they made me live a lifestyle that they felt like was uh, real progressive and showed me how to stay out of the negative lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Okay, they were athletes as well. Did they each excel at their sports? Well, each, each, each one of them went to uh, Wheatley High School, and one of my brothers, he was very active in football, uh, but the rest of them were baseball players, and they were very positive about me playing baseball. And where we are right now, this was a community that we grew up in, but we lived up on the northern end of San Antonio on North Pine Street. And we lived in a big old two-story house, and we had a house in the back where we could bring over people and entertain them. And that's where you supported your friends. Y'all went out in the backyard and got in the back house, and that's where the support came from. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> that's the way it was back then, right? Yeah, but that was because that's what my mother said. Yeah. And when you went back there, you had to represent yourself because if you said something wrong or did something wrong, she was coming out that door mm -hmm. and make you change your lifestyle. So that was a positive thing that she gave us to have that real positive lifestyle that we needed. Yeah. Sounds like Mama ruled the roost. She was kind of an enforcer in the house. Mama used to take the six of us and we had a two-story house that we were living in. And she would put us around her bed and she would point to each one of you and tell you what she thought and what she meant and what you had to do. And that was it. And if you didn't do it, then you were in trouble. Yeah. So that's why we tried to look at each other in a positive way and tell each other what to do and what not to do. Very good. And so as a professional athlete, as a youngster, did you envision that path for your life or did you really just want to? No, I went to Tennessee State University to get an education. And I didn't know that my football career was going to be as effective as it was. And I didn't have no idea that I was going to the Kansas City Chiefs or that I was going to play professional football because I wasn't a big six six athlete and weighed 255 pounds. I was only six feet tall and weighed 195 pounds. So I didn't expect me to be that effective, you know, because I wasn't a big boom, boom, boom. I was just a little, you know, thing. But, but did you envision as a kid, because you were already good, right? Yeah. As, as a, even as a youngster, did you envision As a kid, one that wasn't my objective. As a kid, I looked at the sports to be able to give me a chance to get an education. And that's what I looked at it being able to do. I wasn't looking at becoming a professional athlete. Okay, but you were happy to accept it. But when it came, oh yeah, when it came, I was happy to accept it. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't too long before we had gone to the Super Bowl and we lost the first Super Bowl. But uh, as I came out of the arena and uh, I was acting a little crazy and my mother grabbed me and said, what's wrong with you? And I told her, and she told me that that, uh, that game would be a part of my life for the rest of my life. I had no idea what she's talking about until today. And it's been a part of my life for the rest of my life. I had no idea. Sports Illustrated magazine, they have a magazine that they publish right now. And on the 18th page of that magazine is a picture of me playing in the first Super Bowl. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> to find that. That's outstanding. Yeah. So your family was supportive as well when they when you started going into it. Right. They were very supportive. And my mother inspired us to go to school, 
to get an education and let us know what the education was going to do. And the one thing that I really thought was a great thing about my mother, she made us go to church and represent and get the reflection of what God was going to mean to us in our life. And that was something that I thought was real impressive because right now I know as an athlete, as we went, I went to school at a school called Douglas Junior High School, which still exists. And we used the prayer to pray before we played in any sport that we played in. And I used that prayer in every sport to guide me. And it really helped me make some good positive decisions about what my lifestyle should be like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, they took prayer out of school a while ago. So right. some years ago, they may need to right. consider bringing it back. That was the worst thing that they could have done was taken the prayer out of school because you have to know how to accept winning and you have to know how to accept losing. And if you don't have those two in your mindset on how you're going to do it, because you're not going to be the perfect thing at every one that you participate in. There's going to be some team that's going to do something a little bit better. And you have to learn to accept that and understand that. So you went to Douglas Elementary School. D Douglas Junior High. Junior High. And CUNY Elementary. CUNY Elementary. Mm -hmm. Wheatley High. Wheatley High. Prairie. No, Texas Southern Texas University Southern in, in Nashville, Tennessee. And these were predominantly his, uh, African American. Yes, they were. Mm -hmm. How much of a factor did they play in your success? They played a very, very big factor because it made me understand what my responsibility was to myself and what my attitude had to be toward improving myself and how much education meant to you as an African-American to get you an education so that you could come to progress it in your life and, and do something that you felt that was, you know, productive and not just come out of high school and say, now, what do I do now? And the best thing was to, through all the education, it, it taught you that you were going to have to do something else. And that's what I felt like in high school. They taught us, you may be a good athlete, but you won't be able to do this for the rest of your life. You're going to have to do something else. That's why you're going to need an education. So they were already telling you that this yep. is going to be, right. even if you do learn land in the professions as a professional, it'll be a temporary season. You're going to need to fall back. You're going to need something to fall back on, on education. And that was very, yeah. very inspiring because what they said, you didn't know it. But after you got out of that, you found out they told the truth and it's good that you were able to do that. Okay. Was there a coach or a teacher along the way that really inspired you? Well, I had so many coaches that inspired me and so many teachers inspired me, but they inspired me because they were saying that you may be good as an athlete, but that's one ability that you have, but that's not the only one that you're going to be able to do for the rest of your life. And you're going to need this education. You've got to know how to read, write, and do all those kind of things to help you. And then, too, you have to have a positive attitude about your lifestyle and what you want to do. OK. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about your business after mm -hmm. your, your pro career in a little bit here. So as a black as a black athlete in a professional sport, um, and we did some history that the league had reintegrated in 1946 because mm -hmm. there were other players prior to that. Uh, and we didn't hear about a lot of them unless mm -hmm. you've really been studying it. But um, when you finally came back in the league or when you got into the league after, wh wh what was your first? My first year, year was 1980. Uh, I mean, yeah, 1980. 1980. Okay. So when, you're, when, you, when you first got into the league. Not 1980, 1967. Uh, 67. 67? 67. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because that, that, that was the first Super Bowl. You're right. So around that time. Um, so when you first got in the league, did you feel uh, somewhat like a fish out of water being an African-American? Because there weren't a lot, number one. And then no, you the only thing when I got out of college and went into pro football, I realized that God had given me the ability to have the speed and the knowledge of what you're supposed to do. And the biggest thing was you had to be able to read the defenses and understand what those defenses said. And the thing that I felt good about was I was able to read and understand without having to, what does this mean or what does that mean? I could read and find out what the meaning meant in the defense. So that made me feel real positive because 
that didn't happen when I went to college. That happened way back when I was in elementary school, junior high school, and high school. They said, you better learn how to read, write, and understand. And then once you got into the league, league it wasn't no problem. It's <laughs> right. good. I got this in. Right. right. Outstanding. Outstanding. Um, how about your, your, uh, your, your peers during your professional days, the other athletes around you? Well, I've had a room engagement with Otis Taylor and Glosser Richardson, which were both wide receivers at Kansas City. And what we did was we had a goal and an objective about when you came in that apartment building, there were certain rules and regulations that you had to abide by. And that was something that we made the decision on ourselves to where we got in the right frame of mind and what our responsibility was. And if you didn't live on that responsibility, something was going to happen to you. So we decided what our rules and regulations were when you walked through that front door. Okay. So there were house rules. There were some house rules. House that, routines. And if you didn't adhere to those house rules, then you went out the door with them. All right. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break. We're here with the legendary Willie Mitchell, pro football athlete. We'll be right back. As I developed an appreciation for my personal originality and uniqueness, I began to love the fact that I was different. As I uncovered my individual preferences and my interests, I became comfortable with the real me. Presented by Cedric D. Fisher and Company Publishers. In a world where identity is often challenged and cultures collide, one Woman's Journey shows us the power of resilience, self-discovery, and the unbreakable bonds of family. Born in Hong Kong and raised in America, Helen Yi faced the struggles of finding her place in a new land. Confronted by racism, cultural differences, and personal adversity, Helen's story is one of courage and determination. Inspired by her grandfather's legacy of integrity and entrepreneurship, Helen embarked on a journey of self-discovery. She learned to defend herself against all odds, even fighting off an armed carjacker and escaping with her life. Through the discipline of martial arts, music, and entrepreneurship, Helen found a way to reconnect with her heritage and discover her inner strength. She became a successful business owner and a professional musician, proving that it's never too late to pursue your dreams. I Belong Here is a powerful memoir that takes readers on a journey from the streets of Hong Kong to the heartland of America. It's a story of family, friendship, and the unbreakable bonds that tie us all together. Helen's journey will inspire you to embrace your own uniqueness, face your challenges head on, and find your place in the world. It's a testament to the human spirit and the power of believing in yourself. I belong here, living the life I was born for in America by Helen H. Yee. Available now wherever books are sold. Discover the extraordinary story of a woman who found her voice and her place in the world. Welcome back to the show. We're here with the legendary NFL Kansas City Chief, Mr. Willie Mitchell. Welcome back, Willie. Thank you. So we were talking a little offline about um, obviously your career, mm -hmm. but some of the things outside of your career that made you the professional that you were, not just on the field, but off the field. And one of the things you were sharing with me was during elementary school, junior high specifically, you were taught a prayer mm -hmm. that you used to recite before games or even after games. Mm -hmm. Can you share that with, with our audience? Yes, I can. The prayer was taught to me in, at uh, Douglas Junior High School. And Coach Morris made us say this prayer every time we participated in the sport. And the prayer was, Dear Lord, in the battle that goes on through life, I ask for the feeling that is fair, a chance that's equal for all to strive, a courage to do all to death. If I should win, let it be by the code with my faith and honor held high. But if I should lose, let me stand by the side of the road and cheer as the winners go by. And with that prayer, it lets you know one thing. You will win some and you will lose some, but you have to know how to win 
and you have to know how to lose because you're not going to win all of it all the time. There's going to be some team that's a little bit better, that's a little coach has, and have some superior athletes that we don't have or that we are not. And you have to accept that and learn that. And I think that means a whole lot to you when you lose. You got to watch, about the, look at the other player and say thank you and uh, enjoy the playing the game. Good game that you play, and respect them for doing that. And that's something that stayed with me for the rest of my life through all the sports and through the Super Bowl that we lost in Los Angeles, California. And that made me understand, as my mother told me about that prayer, how to accept that loss because that was a big, big loss. And it really did have a major effect on what I did when I came back to San Antonio and went everywhere else because people focused that attention on that game. And if I didn't know how to accept the loss, then I don't know where I'd be today. So uh, a, a good professional knows how to both win well and almost lose well, it, or at least lose with a good attitude. Well, in the profession, when you lose one, it doesn't work too well. But you've got to learn yourself how to accept that fact that you lost the game. Yeah. And you're going to get blamed for losing the game. Somebody's going to get blamed for losing the game. And just so happened, it happened to be me in the first Super Bowl. So I had to accept that fact and come back because everywhere I went, there was a finger pointing at me saying, yeah, you're the one that lost that game in Kansas City against Green Bay. And if I didn't know how to accept that, or and if I didn't have that faith in God, I'd be in trouble today. So I'm glad I learned the prayer. I'm glad I used the prayer. And if I can participate in any athletics right now, I use that same prayer. You grew up in San Antonio, and there's been a lot of changes here since uh, the days you grew up. Um, a lot no, a, a lot of negativity was going on back then on this side of town. And there's still negative stuff going on. So there was a lot of peer pressure to, you know, at least venture into some negative things. Mm -hmm. How did you handle that? And did you give in to it? The way that I handled that started with my mother because she told us what she expected and what she expected us to do. And then in the school system, we had a good presentation from the teachers about what they expected of us. And then between us as individuals, we made the choice and the decision that if we were friends, we were not friends with the negative behavior. We stayed friends with the positive behavior. And if you were my friend, you had to live in a positive behavior and have some positive thoughts about life. But if you're doing anything negative, we didn't want to participate with you. Okay. So you just you'd push them back and get them on out of the way. And I had many friends to do that. But I decided I wasn't going that way. And I made up in my mind. If you came to me and you didn't want to leave, I'd make you leave with some physical activity. <laughs> so that was the way that I protected myself. If you didn't understand me, don't come to me because then I'm going to give some of this physical stuff out to you and you're going to have to deal with that. Force, little, yeah. little enforcement. That's good. <laughs> one, one more sports question, and then we'll talk about life after sports. So, the, the NFL nowadays, the, and they've got diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, principles and policies and everything else. How do you feel about the diversity in the league at this point? Well, I have a real negative and positive opinion about it, but since I'm not there and I want to represent it in a positive way. I have, there's some negative things that I see, but I leave the league to find those out and talk about this because I don't like to discuss them too much uh, because I'm not there and I don't know what's been going on within the teams. And so I don't want to say too much, too many negative things about it. Yeah. I know this, uh, the, the, the recent draft, they had the first three picks were black quarterbacks, which right. was, that was very encouraging to mm -hmm. see that, you know, we have finally come of age as being a quarterback. And we should be accepting that because that was something that took a long while for them to even select the black quarterbacks to come in. And then the other thing is that most people don't know what those black quarterbacks are making when they come in there. 
they're not getting no 200000 dollars $300,000 starting off with, they're starting off with millions. Right. And that's a wonderful way because that's not a million a year. That's a million in 15 weeks. <laughs> Good money. Right. And then we lost a legend this week, Mr. Jim Brown. Jim Brown. Then did you guys play against each other? We didn't. We played each, uh, against him one time, but not that. And that was an exhibition game. Yeah. But we didn't play against Jim Brown. He was, he retired that next year after we came in. He definitely was as much a, a sportsman as he was, I mean, off the field as he was on the field. Yeah. Dominant on the field, no doubt. But uh, he carried himself well, had a good attitude. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that same way? About I feel the same. I feel like Jim Brown was very representative when he was here playing, and he represented us in a real good way. And I don't think we had nothing negative to say about him because he was a good athlete. And he always was talking impressive about what we need to do and what our characteristics need to be. Let's talk about life after sports. Um, you now direct the nonprofit San Antonio Fighting Back. Tell us a little bit about the nonprofit. Well, I was on the board of the Alamo Chamber of Commerce, and the grant came that they wanted to uh, fund this program. And the staff there told me, well, since we can get the funding, you go on and run the program. And then I became the executive, I mean, the chairman of the board of the, of the board. That's what they wanted me to do. Then a young lady wanted to go to, to Washington, D.C. to become, uh, one of the representatives there and she wanted to leave. So that meant that I had to take over as the executive director of San Antonio Fighting Back. So describe what Fighting Back is. San Antonio Fighting Back is a nonprofit that deals with all types of social issues, drugs, and alcohol, uh, present, uh, present, prevention, uh, representing the community in positive ways, uh, addressing some of the needs that where organizations need help with the, uh, to implement their programs. And that's, that's another activity that we have with San Antonio Fighting Back. And it deals with a lot of, of a drug prevention program. And it's really geared to help the community make a better uh, place for themselves and show them how to address their life and try to have a good quality of life and offer training for those people who can't get the thing that they need to become positive people. That's very important because you got a lot of folks who uh, either are incarcerated or, or coming out one day with ex-con on their resume and they won't be able to maybe even vote and get a job. One of the biggest issues that we have right now is when we look at the education system, it talks about young people becoming positive and making a better lifestyle. But we took one thing out of the education system, which was vocational education. And that vocational education had an address for females and males. But today, I can tell you that if you look at vocational education, where we are right now and where we're standing and sitting, I can tell, take a group and teach them this, and I'll guarantee them every one of them will be able to go out at some point in time and open their own company where they can make good money or work for another company and make the same amount of money. It's so much money that is given in vocational education until it's unreal. You look at every street and every highway that's in San Antonio, there is some kind of construction going on. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to learn how to operate a machine. You have to learn how to drive a truck. You have to know how to put cement and all that. But that takes an education. And you think them people ain't making a nice living? They are making a wonderful living. But we don't teach people that you don't have to go to college and get a master's degree to make them to have. I can teach you how to take a hammer and beat a nail in it, and I'll show you how you can make the same amount of money they make. And the other thing about it is, and this move maybe we shouldn't say, but God has given everybody an ability. You have the ability to use these or use these. This one. 
You have to be the one to figure out which one do you want to use because you have the ability in both of them, but you are the person that has to make the determination. And we don't do that. You know, and we got sports looked at as one of the major issues in the world. That's all right. But everybody can't play football, baseball, or basketball. But that didn't say that you don't have ability here that you can use. And this one up here, you can use it too. But you have to develop it as you come up. And you can't wait till you get 22 or 23 and say, oh, what am I going to do in life? No, that's something that you have to start looking at and thinking about as a young kid. And you got to build yourself to that. So are those some of the principles that San Antonio, San Antonio fight, fighting back is all about? That's what we try to do is to reach out to the community to say, how can we come in and teach kids and go and, and counsel the parents on what the responsibility is and let the young people know that they have some talents and they have to find the talent that they have within themselves in order to use it. That's what San Antonio Fighting Back is approach is to help the community grow in the best way it can and show people how to address themselves to where they can get a better lifestyle. Are the majority of your, your I don't want to call them patients, but uh, folks that come through, are they recovering addicts or current addicts? The, or? The, the, the basic principles that we have are grants that we give, and it says how to address those issues in the community. And we have them going out to different organizations, making presentations on what's the best pro process to you and how can we help you get involved in doing that. And that's what we try to do, help them administer a program to the community where they can bring about some improvements with people's thoughts and process about what their lifestyle can be. Okay. Do you work with other agencies? Other agencies, anybody that can be. And we have different organizations here that go out and work with all different agencies on trying to develop those type of lifestyles for people. Okay. Willie, you're very confident of yourself. You're very assured and very um, driven. Yeah. Even at your age. How old are you, by the way? To I'm 79. 79 years old. I can't tell you. I can tell you off this camera, but I can't tell you on this camera why I have to give you that style that too. No problem. Because that was something that was done that's not right and I can't talk about that. Mm. Not publicly, I can't. All right. We'll have to bring you back for another show. Uh, but let's talk about just your natural um, assurance. Has there ever been a time in your life where you weren't so sure of yourself? Did, has there ever been a time where you felt like there was more you could be doing? The only thing that I can say about that is that I had a mother and a father, and with what she taught us and gave us the desire, and she meant it because she would talk to us and tell us what the goals and objective was and what she expected from us. And that's what I have helped me go through life is to remember what my mother said we could do, what she expected of us, and live that lifestyle in the way that she asked us to do it. And that's what has made me accept the fact that where I am today is simply because of her. And then how can I address that issue with other people to try to encourage them to do the same thing? And especially with the younger generation. Because I need the younger generation needs to know that they have a, it's plenty of people that don't know the ability of these and the ability of this. But nobody lets them know that there is something here that you may think that you can't make a living with, but you can. But this is going to have to be developed too, because if you didn't develop this, you can't do nothing else, because some of it takes where you got to learn how to, you got to read, subtract, multiply, divide, and add. Well, if you don't do that, then you can't do this. And that's why I think it makes the whole difference. You have to let people know that they have the ability to do the thing they want to do is just that how do you address it in a positive way? It's just like your ability. I don't have that ability. I can't blame you for that. But I can accept the fact that you have one for the rest of them that are taking the pictures here. They have an ability that we don't have. 
But they didn't do that just by saying, oh, I'm going to do this. They had to go to school to do something to learn how to do it. Other words, they couldn't do it. So how did they get there? They knew this, and they had to use this too. So you have to learn how to develop both of them. That's my thought process about it. I learned how to catch a football, throw a football, and run one. But I don't know how to pull a two. <laughs> but you also know how to read a defense. Right. Yeah. Nah, nah, I, mean, I don't know how to read a defense. That's it. So at almost 80 years old, you got to be thinking about the, the R word at some point. Retire. I don't know when I will retire because I don't have no reason to retire. And my objection is, is to help others as much as I possibly can, as long as I can. And I don't have a desire to go out and make a whole lot of money and do all those things. That is something that's in the past. My thing is, is how can I show others what enabled me to do this and let them know that they have the same ability and they can do the same thing. It's just that they have to be the ones to recognize what is it that they want to do. So that's the way I feel about it. And I know we don't do that. And I don't think that my biggest problem is a lot of people bring up racial issues. Race don't have nothing to do with you using this or this. Nothing. It's the individual. And it comes from the individual. That's what I think. And don't worry about the rest of it because you can do it if you put forth an effort. Yeah. And that's what I try to teach the young people to do is put forth the effort to do that and see what they can do. Okay. Um, I know most people that know you, that I know, mm -hmm. they know how you lead by example, that you really don't preach, you know, doing things the right way. You just show them in the way that... that just just show it. Don't go out there. I just think you need to show it the right way. And I think that I have to live a lifestyle like that, you know. Uh, I have never had a, you know, want to be somebody to drink. I owned the nightclub, but my brother, he was the operator of that club, not me. But I just feel like you have to use the ability that God gave you to do the thing that you want to do, but you have to find that out yourself. And a lot of people don't think that they have the ability is because they haven't tried to find out what it is they can do and have that desire to want to do it and push for it. That's, that's what my thought process is. It's just like, and I, I want to say this before I leave. This floor that's right here, I can take four people and teach them how to do this, and we're going to charge you $1.90 a square foot to put this one in. Well, when we get through with putting this, that ain't the cost of the floor. That's just the cost of our labor to put it in. But when we get through with it, we're going to have four of us where we're going to split up $700. And we're not going to do this one time. We're going to do this four, five times a day or a week because it don't take that long. But how much money are we going to make a week? I'll bet you we'll make a nice little salary because I've owned the floor covering company. I've owned the construction company. I know what can be made. It's just the fact that uh, my degree is in biology. I don't care about no biology. I started off in school and told my wife, I can't do this. And I had to do something else. But I know what I can do with this construction. I can take a piece of wood and go no more than two miles away from this building. And there's a machine hanging up there. And I can take, you see that piece of wood on the wall? I can take that and put a design on the wall and come back and put it and it's going to look different. But guess what? I'm going to charge you for doing that. And I'll teach you how to do it. And you can go all the way around this floor and all of this. But guess what? You charge him for it. So you have the mind of a businessman, <laughs> an entrepreneur. Yeah. You're a former athlete, professional. Mm -hmm. You're a devoted husband. How many, how many years have you been married? I've been married 54 years. 54 years. Mm -hmm. It's a, long, a lot longer than a lot of people have been living. I, but I've met through the, 
lady in college and I gave her a hundred dollars to go buy her a birthday present because we were practicing. And when she came back, she brought me $37 back out of that hundred. And I said, thank you. That's a, she brought some change back. I didn't expect to get nothing back out of it. But when she brought me that change back, I said, hmm, buddy, I'm going to think about this here a little bit stronger because she, and we've been together ever since. It's fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. Christian man, father, mm -hmm. entrepreneur, nonprofit leader. In our experiences doing this talk show, and they're always leaders that we have the privilege of interviewing. There's one thing they all have in common, and that is they're readers. Mm -hmm. Leaders are readers. Yeah. And they always have their go-to book. You could tip on their nightstand. Right. What book's on your nightstand? None. No book. No books. My wife has been trying to get me to write a book for the last, oh, I guess five years. And... I guess I don't have no problem. I mean, I understand what she's talking about, but it just hasn't driven me to do it. And my biggest problem is sitting in a room doing hung and hung and hung. That's my biggest problem. And when I get home, <clears throat> going home, sit down, I I go out and start doing some yard work. I'll go and look at the window under some of the walls, and I say, I know I'm going to change that. I'll get to changing that, and I'll fix that. But for me to go home and sit down and hang, hey, hey, that's just not one of mine. We're also professional publishers. You know that, so we could talk offline yeah. about that. Last question for you. Should any of our viewers who have watched this episode today want to reach out to you or get in touch with you, what's the best way to? Well, the best thing to do is contact me at San Antonio Fighting Back at 2803 East Commerce Street, and the telephone number is 271-7232. 271 Is there a website? No, I don't use the website. And the area code is 210. My whole thing is because I don't use the web, I want to have the contact with the individuals and make sure that we contact. And anything that I suggest to do, we'll sit down and discuss it first. Okay. So you still believe in that personal interaction? I believe in that personal contact because I just think that I can say a lot of things on that phone, but I can't see the expression on your face. But when we deal with each other, we say, well, that lets me know a lot of things that I can talk to you about, tell you about, and I know some of you accept, and some of you looked at me and said, you must be crazy. You know, but that's okay too. But I want to have the direct contact, you know, and then we move on from there. One final question. Is there any other parting words you'd like to leave with the audience here? It's your opportunity to kind of... The only other thing I say is believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. And believe in God because you have the ability to do a lot of things that you don't know, but you got to put some effort to it and have some faith and let God show you what the best thing. The legendary Willie Mitchell, former NFL professional athlete, we appreciate your time. Thanks thank for you joining for us today. I appreciate it too. And thank you for joining us. I want to give all my thanks to the production crew here, all the engineers, interns, everyone that's working for us. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. Make sure you follow us on social media. And for a recording of this particular episode of the show, go to your YouTube search bar, toss in San Antonio's Influence Magazine show. Once that comes up, please give us a thumbs up or uh, a like. Subscribe and as well, hit that bell so that you don't miss any further episodes of the show. I'm your host, Cedric Fisher. We'll see you next time.